and our online family and friends. We are just so excited to be back with you on today. We're going to ask that you stand as we give God the glory and give him the praise and the honor for just allowing us to see another day.
call your attention to Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. In the New Testament, the book is Matthew, the chapter is 20, the verses are 29 through 34. I want to remind you, we serve the awesome and the amazing God. Yes, Lord. He has blessed us one more. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. And for that, we are thankful. Thank you. Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34 is where we are. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out the more, saying, Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, son of David. Yes. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight. Amen. And they followed him. Amen. I want to talk about Jesus, the great healer. Yes, he is. I know he is. Jesus. I know he is. The great healer. Yes, yes. If you don't need a healing physically, you may need one spiritually. All right. If you don't need one, and I believe all of us do, need yes, one yes. spiritually, you may need one in these turbulent times emotionally. Yes. Now that COVID has rolled in and still is real, yes, yes. I know somebody need one socially. <laughs> Because you ain't been able to fellowship like you usually do. Mm. If you don't need a healing socially, then I'm sure you need a healing practically. Mm -hmm. Because all of us got some kind of problem. Yes, Lord. All of us have more than one problem. Yes, sir. If you got all the money you need, you still have a problem. Some people thought that if I just hit the lotto, if I can just get a million dollars, if I can get half of a billion, problem solved, situation gone, circumstances disappear. But many of those who have won in three years are broke. Some have even committed suicide. Many have gotten attacked because people knew they had money. No, no. It's because our nation, our world needs a healing. That's right. And it doesn't matter what politicians we put in. That's right. If we don't have God on our side, well. we need a healing from the Almighty God. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they don't want or not. We still need a healing from Jesus. Right. Doesn't matter if your county judge had not struggled and won. We still need a healing from Jesus. Even though the local mayor is of color, we still need a healing from Jesus. In the text, in the text, people are following Jesus. Matthew records this text. Right after the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus, kneeling down and asking him a question. Mm -hmm. Lord, will you make my children the ball of the shot caller? Mm -hmm. Lord, will you make my children 
sit on the pedestal, one on the right and one on the left. Lord, will you handle them and bless them? But we need to understand neither power nor fame offer us the healing. We, not, we need to understand it only takes the favor of God yes. to get you where you need to be. Lord, I thank you. In the text, in the text it declares to us that there were two blind men. Mark and Luke record one blind man. But Matthew, because he's writing to Jews on behalf of the Jews, he looks deep into the subject matter and he identifies two blind men. Theologians believe that these blind men were beggars. They believe that they were broke. They believe that these blind men didn't have any money. And as these two blind men, they couldn't see Jesus. But they had heard noise of Jesus the Christ. You see, the grapevine, the grapevine had said that this Messiah, this man called Jesus, is in town. The text declares, now as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. They weren't following the disciples, they were following Jesus. My first point to you today is that we point out people. We see people. The first thing we see is people. And when we see these people, it's a great multitude, Matthew says. And when he sees these people, these people are following Jesus. Yes, we have to give the people, we have to give the multitude credit. They knew who to follow. In these days, people don't know who to follow. Right. We have people who, are, who want to go down in history for shooting up a school, and they just want to be known. They just oh, want to no, be no. famous. They just want to follow the last school shooter. All right, all right. And they don't see, I guess they have a blinded eyes to what the last school shooter went through. People want to shoot up churches. People want to have road rage. And, and they want to become famous by crazy stuff. It's because they're following the wrong people. You see, on, 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 our, on our social media, we want to make sure we have a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people are suffering from low self-esteem because they don't have the number of followers they want. Mm -hmm. And then we want to make sure that we follow the right person on social media. Mm -hmm. So every time that person posts, every time that person tweets, we want to get it. We want to know what, what's going on and what is to be seen. This multitude, this people, knew who to follow. This people had gotten instructions. Jesus had, had given them parables. Jesus had let them know that I am the healer. Some of them were following for the loaves and bread. Are you following Jesus because of what you can get? Are you following Jesus because he fed the 5,000 and you, you saw him or you heard of him and you're just following him because of what you can get? This multitude had a band of people and these people, some of them was following them because they wanted to be in the crowd. Some people are following people because they want to be a part of the crowd. I oftentimes laugh when I ask people what church you go to and I ask them, I ask them what, who's the pastor, and then I ask them who's the chairman of deacons, and, and I ask them who's one of the ushers on the floor, and they can't name the pastor, they can't name a deacon, they cannot even name one of the persons who work at the church. But when you call them and you ask them, where do they attend? What congregation? If they can't tell you the name, they'll throw it out there. I go to Lakewood. <laughs> yes, yes. The reason, Brother Miles, they can say Lakewood is because who's going to count them? Yeah. Who's going to hold them accountable? <laughs> who's going to notice them? With nearly 50,000 people in attendance on one weekend, I can just say Lakewood. People love crowds. That's right. People 
people like to be identified with a big number. Even preachers, man, doc, doc, how many you got on Sunday? Uh. And it's always an elevated number because even the pastor want to be identified with the crowd. That's right, that's right. Even the politicians, when they get a religious leader to help them out, they go and choose the religious leaders that have a crowd. Come on, this group. This people was following the right person. They may not have had the right motivation, but at least they were following the right person. So the first thing I see is this people. The second thing I see is these problems. I see problems. I'm, I'm telling you, everywhere I look, there are problems. Everywhere I go, there's problems. Everything I read, I see problems. Everything I watch, I see problems. These blind men, two blind men sitting on the side of the road as they as they come out of Jericho. Matthew said they were coming out. And, and Mark and Luke said they were coming out or going in. It, it doesn't matter where Jesus was headed. They found their way on the side of the road where Jesus... These people had problems. Do you have a problem? Yes. Are you one who really got it going on? You really got it made and, and you don't have to worry about anything or in any way? Are you in a fix that you need Jesus to fix? Are you in a situation that only Jesus can fix? Let me tell you, I'm in a situation right now only Jesus can fix. It's a struggle within us. Paul says, every time I want to do good, evil is present with me. There's a war going on in us. And if there's not a war going on in you, then you are not saved. All right, all right. Because the moment you get saved, yeah. the devil get on, the, on his sickle. He, he gets on his wheel. He gets on you like never before. Some folk have lied and said, if you come to Jesus, all of your problems will be solved. I've been on this road a mighty long time now. And every time I look up, and here come another problem. These men had problems. They had eyes and they couldn't see. They had eyes, but they could not imagine because they had not seen it before. The reason why you can imagine certain things is because you've seen certain things before. These men, these, these two men, these two men were sitting on the side of the road and they heard that Jesus was passing by. They listened to the right thing. Sometimes you don't need to listen to certain things. If you're in your prayer life and you, you're asking God for something, there will go always be somebody that tell you to leave it alone. These men passing on the, these men saw Jesus passing on the side of the road. They are sitting on the side of the road. And as they sit there, they have these problems. They heard that Jesus was passing by. And they said, have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. I want to tell you there's the promise of Messiah. Yeah, yeah, there are people, there are problems, but this is the promised Messiah, the promised one, Jesus himself. When you see the words, son of David, it is the fact that, that God has said that there will always be one on the throne that is of the lineage of David. They recognize Jesus. They couldn't see, but they recognize. They couldn't visualize certain things, but they knew the promised Messiah had shown up. They saw Jesus with a spiritual eye. Too many of us looking at natural stuff. Too many of us looking at what is right now. Too many of us observing what's going on around us. Too many of us do not see things with the spiritual eye. 2006, we drove by this property, and it was 30-foot trees. It was thick. And then you can only get down through here barely with a car. Mm -hmm. Some people, and they verbalized it, some people saw a forest. 
I saw a soul mind. But when you look at things with a spiritual eye, you see beyond what your eyes can see. So we've gone from a horse pastor. We've gone from a cow pastor. We've gone from a forest to a soul mind. Where lives are being changed. Where hope is being renewed. Where people are driving from the other side of town just to get here. It's because of the promise. They saw with their spiritual eyes the promised Messiah. So they called out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. Let me tell you, if you got a problem, mercy will suit the case. If you got issues, mercy will suit the case. If you got stuff going on in your life, you need mercy from the Almighty God. Mercy is when God allows you to receive blessings even though you don't deserve it. That's all right. Mercy is when God withholds the damage that you've done and the judgment that you ought to be in. God withholds the sinners from you. God withholds killing you. I just want to tell you, I don't deserve to be here. It's not because I've been so good. I don't deserve to be here because I'm so spiritual. I don't deserve to be here because I'm a preacher. Many preachers dead and gone. Amen. That was way more spiritual than I am. It's only because of God's mercy. He kept justice away. God's mercy gave me one more chance. Some of you been diagnosed with something that should have taken you out of here 50 years ago, 20 years ago. But God's mercy rolled up on you. It's only because of God's mercy. And young people, if you don't have any issues right now, keep waking up in the morning. Keep trusting God's mercy because God's mercy will find a way when there is no way. When you ask God for something, ask for mercy. And the reason why you ask for mercy is because you know you messed up. You may not admit it to me. You may not admit it to them. But God has seen everything you thought, everything you said, and everything you've done. And you just need to bow your head humbly before him and say, have mercy on us. Yes. Son of David, have mercy. Yeah, I see the people. I see problems. I see the promised Messiah. But I see pessimism. Yeah. Hmm. I see pessimism. Whenever you're going through some stuff, there's some, and you're trying to be optimistic, there's always somebody that's going to be pessimistic. There will always be somebody that can tell you what God won't do for you. Hmm. Hmm. There will always be somebody that will tell you what you won't be able to make it through. There will be always somebody that will tell you that God won't do it for you. Every time they tell me what God won't do for me, I just raise my head toward heaven, look them dead in the face, and say, let's see what God has to say about it. Because God can do with no other power, Holy Ghost power, God can do with no other power can do. Pessimism. Look at the pessimism. They cry out, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, son of David. Have mercy on us, son of David. Then the multitude became spiritual cops. <laughs> it says the multitude, in verse number 31, it says the, the multitude warned them. They ought to be quiet. They ought to shut up. Hold your peace. I just want to tell you, in the midst of pessimism, people will always try to tell you how not to receive your blessing. That's right. In the midst of pessimism, every now and then, somebody will shut you down when you're trying to use your blessing and your prayer life to get to God. Let me tell you, look at what it says. They, they saw this pessimism, and the Bible says they told them to be quiet. Look at what it says. It says they cried out all the more. So, so, so Matthew, Matthew records two times that they called on the son of David. But the text declares and the text speak to the fact that they kept right on crying. Let me tell you, prayer, your prayer life ought to be one that's always crying out to the Lord. 
your prayer life ought to be one that you continue to tell God about your situation. Your prayer life ought to be one that you don't let the pessimism, the people that wallow in pessimism, don't let them shut down your prayer life. All right. Somebody will always try to distract you. That's right. You're on a mission. You, somebody in this room has a mission. Somebody in this room is on a mission. Somebody is on a mission to get their blessing, and they need their blessing. And they've been calling on God for they They followed Jesus. They followed, and they've seen Jesus. They've declared their blessings before Jesus. And pessimism shows up. You better make sure that you cry out the Lord. Well, Mr. Pessimism, I see persistence. There is some persistence there. The Bible says they didn't just cry one time. It really says that they didn't just cry out two times. The Bible says they cried out the more. And they were persistent. Let me tell you, don't let people distract you from crying out the more. That's right. That's right. And, and when they cried out the more, guess what they did? They, they cried out the same thing. Don't let people get you off of your game. That's right. Don't let people get you off your prayer life. Yeah. Cry out the more and don't change your prayer life to please them. All right. All right. Don't, don't change it. Don't, don't change your prayer life to please anybody. Don't, and then don't let the circumstances and the traditions around us stop you from crying out. All right. Some people, when they go to church, Every Sunday they shout and they praise the Lord and they raise their hands and they give God a good praise. But then when they invite their co-workers, they sit back and they won't praise them because they don't want their co-workers to look at them on Monday differently than they looked at them Sunday. But let me just tell you, let me remind you, your co-worker can't heal you. Your co-worker can't make things better for you. Your neighbor won't fit for you. Let me tell you, you better cry out the more. Matter of fact, I believe that our blessings come sometime as we cry out the more and we are persistent at it. Yeah. Cry out the more. The, the Bible said, they said, y'all need to shut up, sit down somewhere. Y'all need to be quiet. We got a ceremony going on here. Sometimes, even in the Baptist church, we need to put the program aside. Sometimes we need to get to a point in our lives where we let the Holy Spirit lead, direct, and keep us. Now, I'm not talking about foolish stuff. I'm not, I'm not talking about like Paul said to the women, you be quiet and when you, when you got questions, go home and ask your husband. It's because they were upset in the service. But whenever it's praise time, whenever there's prayer time, Everybody ought to be in the midst of praise, and everybody ought to be in the midst of prayer. That's why I say before, before church decides to start, before church uh, begin, before church get kicking off, you need to have a moment of quietness before the Lord. You see, these guys, they weren't worried about it. Matter of fact, they weren't talking to the multitude anyway. There will be always some things that people will put their nose in that don't concern them. That don't, I mean, it has nothing to do with you. Matter of fact, I'm calling on somebody who can help me. I'm not talking to somebody who can turn me away. And we will let tradition turn us away. We will let things that happen over and over again, things we've seen turn us away. Somebody, somebody still in that dead church that they grew up in. Because my mama and them, my big mama and them, my great great granddad and them, and I want I want to make sure I keep the the the, the household going with the name. I want this David's name to continue to exist. So I want to be here. And some people are still at the church so they can control the atmosphere. Some people, some people, can, they're still hanging around because they can do things that they know they can't go anywhere else to do. That's right, you're right. And we have to get to a point where we come to meet Jesus. Okay. And when we come to meet Jesus, we come to meet him because we've already gotten together with him even before we get to church on Sunday. Yeah. Don't wait till you get to church to pray 
to the Lord, to praise the Lord, spend time with the Lord, because you ought to get in your secret closet, make it personal, make it private, make it powerful, because God is the one who blesses us. Yes, right. Right. Says they were persistent. They were persistent. They were they were calling on the Lord. They were so persistent, the Bible said they called on them more and more. They didn't change who they were called. There are religions out here that develop every day. And everybody got a new thought. They got a new way of doing things. They got a new way of folk getting in line every day. They're getting in line for hands to be laid on them for them to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know if you got Jesus, he is the anointed one? Don't you know if you got Jesus, he is the one that makes us whole? We have to yield to the Holy Spirit. And as we yield to him, he empowers us. We have to yield to him. Give him opportunity. The Bible teaches that the greater one is in us than in the whole world. So you have to be persistent. Then there's participation. There's participation. This, this participation is the fact so Jesus stood still and called them and asked the question, what do you want me to do? When you participate with Jesus, Jesus will ask the question. Don't get involved in a conversation with somebody else because they make a suggestion that you do. When, when I'm watching courtroom scenes and uh, you got a plaintiff and a defendant, every now and then they'll stop talking to the judge and start cross talking across and arguing with each other. And the reason why the defendant want to make sure that he or she starts an argument is because they want you to get your attention off what you've been doing. And they want you to make sure that you look bad in front of the judge. And it's the judge's responsibility every time to say, don't talk to him. Don't talk to her. Talk to me. When you bring your case before the judge, take it before the judge who can fix it. He is the magistrate. He is the judge. He is the one who can fix it. You got to participate with Jesus. You can name it and claim it all day long. But you're going to have to participate with Jesus. You're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to seek the face of God. You're going to have to turn from your wicked ways. God will hear from heaven, and you will hear from heaven, and God will heal your way. Right, right. What if, what, what if just a few Christians mm -hmm. will spend time together before, during, and after the election mm -hmm. asking God to bless, asking God to keep, asking God to anoint our city, anoint our state, anoint our nation. Yeah. What if a few Christians mm -hmm. would allow God to continue to bless through our prayer? We ought to be bombarding heaven. Because you know what? We're not winning the elections. We're really not winning the elections. So we have to make sure that God hears from us. We have to bombard heaven with our prayers. With our hearts right. We got to pray for, for those who have leadership over us. You have to even pray for your pastor. Pray for anybody that feeds into your spirit. You sure don't want the wrong thing because once it goes out, you can't take it back. Right. Said to a preacher the other day, said, said to him some years back, he said, brother, I know you just preached Isaiah chapter 6. And when you got to your clothes, you got a little excited, I see. And it's all right to get excited. And he started doing that, that same little hoop that everybody do that he heard before him. And he said, he said, one of these days, we're going to have six wings. Mm -hmm. Two wings to cover my face. Mm -hmm. Two wings to cover my feet. Yeah. And two wings, I'm going to fly. Yeah. I said to him, you're not hermeneutically correct. 
and you're not homiletically sound. He said to me, that doesn't matter to me. You heard how they took it, don't you? Didn't you see the people jumping and the people shouting? And didn't you see how they respond to it? I said, so you're comfortable with lying on God because it's the seraphims that have the wing. It's not us who have the wing. We are in spirit. And at the resurrection moment, when Jesus cracks the sky, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him. Amen. We don't need wings. We just need the resurrection to take place. And at the resurrection, God will call us. Call us all home. You got to participate. The last point I see is the privilege. That's a privilege. It's a privilege. It's a, it's a privilege to walk with Jesus. It's a privilege to know who God is. It's a privilege to participate with him. It's a privilege to ignore the people. It's a privilege. Look at what the text says. The text in verses 33 and 34, it says, they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion. If you participate with Jesus, he will have compassion on you. Now don't go to Jesus trying to hide stuff. You got to participate with it. The thing that wrecked marriages is that premarital counseling, they don't lay it all on the table. And the same thing they refuse to lay on the table is the same thing that wrecked their marriage within three months. It's because we got to come before God, empty-handed, and lay it all on it. And when we walk away from it, we have nothing in our hearts, nothing in our hands, and no baggage to bear. You better tell it all now. Because it's going to come out later. And it's going to come out at a time you don't want it to. So he says, he says to us that it's a privilege. Mm -hmm. So they said, we want our eyes open. Stop answering questions that are not asked of you. That's right. If some of you went to court, the judge would have to say about 10 times, just answer the question now. Right. Just answer the question. Just answer the question. Right. Sometimes you ask students questions and they want to tell you the whole story. No, give me the Reader's Digest version. Just answer the question. Some people get historical. Mm -hmm. They want to tell it all. Mm -hmm. And they want you to stand there and look at it and be excited while you're looking. Mm -hmm. They want to tell the whole story. These men, they told Jesus, I want our eyes. We want our eyes open. Mm -hmm. Jesus, we want to see. We no longer want to be blind. And we went down to the eye doctor and the eye doctor couldn't fix it. All right, all right. But Jesus, He's the great healer. He is the doctor. He's the one that makes us whole. So it's a privilege to get to know Jesus. It says, it says, so Jesus had compassion. And when he had compassion, he touched their eyes. Let me tell you, Jesus knows right where it hurts. He knows right where it is a problem. He knows right what to do at the time he wants to do it. He knows what you're going through. Jesus has not forgotten you. He knows what you're going through. And guess what? I go to the doctor and I got to tell the doctor everything. He asks, what's your problem? Yeah. Where does it hurt? How long has it been hurt? What you have been taken for? How often you've been taken? What's the dosage? You, now, I thought you were the doctor. Yeah, right. yeah. You got to tell him everything. But when you turn to Jesus yeah. and you participate with him, yeah. just tell him about your problem. Yeah. And when you tell Jesus about the problem, the Bible says he knows where to touch it. The Bible says he touched their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. He wouldn't have been Jesus. He wouldn't have been God. He wouldn't have been the Holy Spirit had he started touching their toes. The other thing about Jesus, when you participate with him and you honor his privilege, he knows where to touch and he, he knows how to touch. That's right. I, told, I told, told a family member the other day, I said, look, the reason why it's imperative to whip your children, mm -hmm. even in the 21st century, mm -hmm. because you know how much you love them. 
And you know how much it takes. You, you know when they let up and you know when they're about to break. But the police officer don't care. The police officer doesn't care. And if you don't deal with them now, then you will have to deal with bandage them up or even funeralizing them. But parents these days want to be friends with their children. They don't want to hurt their feelings. They don't want their children to dislike them. They don't want their children to go in the room and, and, and shut the door on them. Let me tell you, at our house, we couldn't go in the room and shut the door because it wasn't our door. When the door doesn't belong to you, you have no business shutting the door. A father. Father had disciplined a young girl, a teenage girl. And when he got through disciplining her, I mean just talking to her. You can't whip them all the time. You gotta tell them why. You gotta you gotta discipline them. And sometimes the talking is worse than a beating. So he got through talking to his girl. He got through disciplining her. So she walked in, the, in her bedroom, she called it, and slammed the door. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. You know there was a 21st century daddy, right? But the good thing about this daddy, when she got up the next morning, went to school, and she came back home, there was no door standing there. He took the hinges off. He took the door down, laid it in the garage. Now you don't have a door to slam. We have to get to a point where we realize that it's a privilege to do the right thing for the Lord. It's a privilege to walk with him. It's a privilege to throw our burdens on him. It's a privilege. What do you want me to do for you? I want you to open my eyes. I want my eyes to be open. What do you want me to do for you? I want to see. Says, I want to see. Jesus had compassion. He touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight. Mm -hmm. Their eyes received sight. They began to see. Mm -hmm. They began to reason through their optical vision. Mm -hmm. They began to see things that they hadn't seen maybe in a long time or never before. The Bible says immediately, let me tell you, God can move quicker than quick and sooner than right now. God has a way of blessing us in the midst of our issues, and sometimes it looks like God taking a long way around to bless us. But God has a way of meeting our needs immediately, and when he meets our needs, the whole world will see it. Sometimes God will would do it right now. Other times God would do it later. Amen. But Big Mama would say it this way. He may not come when you want. But he's always on time. The God we serve, we have a privilege in him just to be blessed by him. Every morning we wake up, we ought to be able to say, God, I thank you for the privilege of glorifying you one more time. God, I thank you for the privilege that when I they used to say it like this back home. Lord, thank you for when I woke up this morning. Yeah. I realized the bed I laid in was not my cooling board. Yeah. You see, children, the cooling board yeah. is what they lay on later on in the mark. You see, the mark is what they put beds for. He said, Thank you, Lord, that the bed I laid on was not my cooling board. And Lord, thank you that the the seat I wrapped up in was not my winding seat. It's the last place, it's the body bag that they wrap you up in before you leave here. We ought to throw, we ought to throw it at the Lord. We ought to praise and honor him because it's a privilege. Let me tell you, you may not feel like it this morning, but you better raise your hand and thank him. You may not feel like it this morning. You better do your dance now because you may not be here tomorrow. You may not feel like it this morning. But God is rescuing us. He's keeping us. He's blessing us through danger seen and unseen. Finally, it says, the privilege was to follow Jesus. It's a privilege to follow Jesus. I'm telling you it's a privilege. It's a privilege to follow Jesus. It's a privilege to follow Jesus. It is an honor and a privilege. 
just to follow Jesus. It's a privilege to follow Jesus. My youngest brother, Manuel, has a little boy named Manuel. And he's in middle school. He's a little bit frail, skinny boy. And that boy can take the ball, whip it through his leg, round his back, lay it up. It's a privilege. Whenever I go to South Haven, Mississippi, yeah. I just want to walk around with him. Mm -hmm. Because as I walk around with him, he opens doors for me mm -hmm. that I can't get through myself. And if I show up in South Haven, Mississippi, all I have to do is say, I'm with Manny. Mm -hmm. And when I, can, when I can't get through the door, Manny mm -hmm. can at the age of 13, right. he gets the door open for me. It's simply because I'm following him. Yeah. I stop by to tell you. <laughs> our brother Jesus, <laughs> the son of God, yeah. the son of David, yeah. he opens doors for us. Yeah. He makes a way out of no way. Yeah. It's a privilege to be with Jesus. Yeah. It's not a dishonor. It's a privilege to be with him. Yeah. All night yeah. and all day. The angels of the Lord be watching over me because I walk with Jesus all night, all day, driving down a dangerous highway. Jesus is watching over me all night and all day. If I follow Jesus, he can bless me. He can keep me all night and all day. Jesus watches over me in spite of me, in spite of my condition, in spite of what I've done. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for Jesus. We need to consider it a privilege to follow him. Why do you think it's a privilege? Because over 2,000 years ago, on a stone hill called Calvary, they hung him high. Yes! They lifted him high. Yes, they did. They stretched him wide. Oh, yeah. They dropped him low on a skull hill called Calvary. On the old rugged cross. They killed him. They murdered him. They took his life. But no man takes his life. He lays it down. He laid it down for me. He laid it down for you on the old rugged cross. They took him off the cross. Laid him in a bar or two. It was a bar or two. Because early, early that Sunday morning, early, bright and early, he got up with all power, bright and early, before the rooster could crow. He got up early, he got up early in the morning with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. But one day, in this bottle six spirit class, room number two, across the hall from the cafeteria, around 2.30 in the evening, about 2.30 doing study hall in this barn of six period class at 3, 2.30 p.m. across from the cafeteria. Dr. Steele said to me, you can be changed. You can be different. You don't have to live your life like you're living. You can be different right now. Not only did he get up from the dead, he got up in me that day when I bowed my head and said, Lord, come into my life. Make me a new person. I believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, he died on Calvary. He rose from the dead, and he gave us all power. He had all power in heaven and earth. And that same power that raised up a dead Jesus is in us by way of the Holy Spirit. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. Just as you are. I had to come. And I had to come just like I was. Don't, don't wait till you get it right. You'll never get it right. You gotta trust Jesus. He's the only one to get it right. Don't wait till you stop doing your thing. Those of us who are saved already, we still try to stop doing our thing. The door is open. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. Come burden and come happy. Come be down from the world, but come delivered. Come persecuted, 
but not destroyed. The door is open. Will you come to Jesus? Give your heart to God. Trust Jesus as your personal Savior. The door is open. Come just now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next Sunday. He will save you. from the dead. Just say these words, Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe now that you are born again. You need to get in a good Bible teaching church. You need to participate with Jesus. It's a privilege and an honor to follow him. You would have some pessimism. But the promised Messiah, Jesus himself, is available to you. He solves problems. And he shuns people who do not walk with him. If you do not have a church home, if you are in between church homes, this is your opportunity to get it right with God. It's a need for fellowship with the brothers and sisters in Christ. If you struggle with sin like all of us do, I want to pray for you that the Lord will rescue you Father God, we thank you. We thank you for every person, every trial, every group of people. We know we have problems. We confess our problems. We ask you to bless us. Bless us to turn to you, believe in you, and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. Only trust Jesus. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Trust him. Hallelujah to the Lamb. It is offering time. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope. So at lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, or you can mail in your, your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless every giver, bless every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us read together, let us read together this giving scripture found in Luke. 6 and 38. Let's read. Give and you will receive. 
Your gifts were returned to you in full. Press down, shake it together to make room for more running over, running over and pour into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we it's time for it's time for uh, uh, collection. So if you need an envelope, raise your hand. The urchin will serve you. The red envelope is for the pastor love offering and the blue for offering and the inner donation and gift. <laughs> Teachers, safety in schools, Gibby and Art Bahar, Helen, Hannah, Audrey, Brownlee, and Darvish 304. Father, we come praying for these. We ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. Heal, Father God, strengthen. Deliver, Father God. Touch in the name of Jesus. Give them fruitfulness. Give them hope. Give them the desires of their hearts. Yes, Lord. Lord, some of them have been waiting for a long time. Yes, Lord. God, I ask you to give them the desires of their heart. As a church, Father God, we pray that you deliver. We know, Father God, that you deliver in your own time. Yes, but the text says you healed immediately. We even ask you to heal and touch, strengthen, and give hope immediately. That they will follow you with much confidence. That they will follow Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank amen. God. Amen. Amen. Pastor and wife's appreciation is scheduled for next Sunday. In the first service, we will have as a guest preacher. Uh, Reverend Bartholomew Johnson. Reverend Bartholomew Johnson is the first service. In the second service, we will have Pastor Dr. Richard Jewel Rose and the Holy Trinity family worshiping with us. So we want to make sure that we attend and it's just right to show appreciation. That's right. Man. And it's always good to be appreciated. So thank you in advance for coming to both services. And then at the third service, we're gonna serve to go place. We wanna ask you to serve. Invite somebody to be with you. Invite somebody to serve with you. 
that our guests will be healed spiritually and physically. Amen. Amen. So come on back and let's shout and celebrate. Let's celebrate together. Through the month of December, we will be studying the book of Proverbs in your own free time, one book of Proverbs every day. One chapter, rather, one chapter of Proverbs every day, along with your Sunday school uh, scriptures that we study every day to prepare us for Sunday school. You can read it in general, it's what I really want you to do. Read one chapter of Proverbs, read your Sunday school preparation, and each single day in general, each day in general, what the Lord is saying to you. And I guarantee you, when you do it another month, you'll say something different. Please, ma'am, please, sir, the book of wisdom, Proverbs, beginning the 1st of December through the 31st of December. This is in preparation for our Bible listening and journaling again. I know I learned a lot from our Bible listening, uh, names that we didn't know and what role they paid they played in God's kingdom. So starting January 1st, we'll be doing our Bible listening and journaling again. You should already have a notebook. I know last year we backed off because we were going through the prayer, the prayer journal that was, was presented to us. But we're looking forward to going through the whole Bible, Bible listening. And if you choose to read, that's good too. And journaling whatever the Lord has to say to you. So please, ma'am, please, sir, starting December 1st, the book of Proverbs, and starting January 1st, the Bible listening. By January 1, we will have the schedule for the Bible listening. Also, this year, the 31st of December is on a Saturday, correct? It's on a Saturday. So we will do as we did doing, doing the, the height of the COVID-19 era, we will have a Zoom at 8 p.m. on the 31st. We'll have Zoom church, so be prepared. Even if you got your pajamas on, be prepared to give God the glory. So we will meet by way of Zoom at 8 p.m. on the 31st of December. So we can thank God for what he's doing. We can testify to his goodness. Amen. 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 We thank the Lord for who he is and what he's all about. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. Let us stand to be dismissed. blessing people. Lord, we realize that we have some problems. But Lord, we know you promised us by way of the promised Messiah that you could bless us in our problems. Lord, we've seen the pessimism. Lord, but you are faithful and we want to be faithful to you. And Lord, we're going to be persistent and continue to tell you about our issues and tell you about our problems. Lord, we're willing to participate with you. Yes, Lord. With you as our leader and you as our guide. We know we can't go wrong if we participate 
with you. And Lord, we consider it a privilege. We consider it an honor. We consider it a great opportunity to walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to get to know you, to learn of you, to walk with you. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying,